Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, very happy to see all of you and some familiar faces. Um, we uh, uh, um, we wanted to do this talk in uh, in the physical now because uh, Singapore has already you know lifted all the COVID rules and all that, and we really hope that Constantino City is going to be a place where design, discourse, and discussions are going to happen. And uh, I, I want to thank Constantino for supporting this uh, talk series that I conceptualized because to, it's really to bring the co design community together and of course uh, people who are interested in design to come together to talk about design and to uplift the profession uh, together. And tonight I'm uh, also very grateful to some of my friends in design, uh, John Francois, of course, uh, Wing Hin and Kalin from Studio Lapis and uh, Jerome Ng, very actually excellent designers, very talented people who oblige me to spend their Friday nights here to share their work. So I'm um, really grateful to, to you guys for supporting this. Yeah, round of applause for them. So uh, I, I really hope all of you will enjoy the talk tonight because we have a very rich uh, uh, program put together for you, really great projects. Uh, and without much further ado, let me introduce the first speaker, uh, Jerome Ng, uh, young, talented uh, designer. Jerome Ng is an architectural designer and an educator who is an enthusiast in architecture, film and visual communication. Jerome has always um, believed in an interdisciplinary approach to art and design projects and he has created unique and uh, multifaceted works that appeal to a more diverse audience. Jerome is also a strong believer in the power of storytelling and imagination. He adopts a nuanced approach utilizing both analog and digital tools and employs different techniques in depicting a narrative. Jerome strives to work on projects regarding social and cultural issues in the society, providing a voice for the minority and those in need and contributing to the wider community with designs and art that makes real tangible differences in their lives. So uh, let's put our hands together for Jerome. Uh, okay. Hi everyone. <laughs> um, actually, first and foremost, I just want to take this opportunity to thank uh, the team from Constantino as well as Kelly Cheng for inviting me to give this talk you know, and to share my work. And I'm definitely very privileged to be able to present the things that I love to do and the things that I've been doing and currently been doing, especially with uh, sharing this stage with the, the panel, especially John Francois from Studio Milo as well as uh, Wing Heng and Carling from Studio Lapis. Yeah. Oh, the clicker. <laughs> okay. Oh, okay, I can remove the mask. Can you hear me? Is it bad? better? <laughs> Sorry. So, um, Thank you for the introduction, Kelly. Um, so I don't have to introduce myself, but um, just a little, really a little short introduction. You know, I'm a, actually a creative de architectural designer who has a background in visual communication, right? So I actually graduated from um, art design media in NTU with majoring majoring in visual communication, and then after which I actually ventured to uh, UK, and then I was there for the whole eight years working and studying at the Ballard School of Architecture. So, um, when, so when, when people ask me, right, what do I actually do? You know, I, I actually do a lot. I, I, don't have a, I don't have a generic, say, I'm an architect or I'm an interior designer or I'm a graphic designer. I actually do a lot because I believe in the interdisciplinary approach to, to projects. So, in terms of um, profession, right, for, 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 for the start, I'm actually an interior designer plus an architectural de uh, designer. So I actually have my own firm, and I do interiors, you know, houses, landers, yeah. And then on top of that, you know, I also do illustrations, right? Architecture illustrations, you know, my project always usually adopt a newest approach to speculative research. So utilizing um, 
both uh, analog and digital tools to investigate the the to investigate narrative within the space, right? And then to to look into the urban tectonics of the built environment. Yeah. So these are some of the illustration works that I've been working on, and this is one of them in the Saint James Power Station in collaboration with Studio Lapis, of course. <laughs> and some of them, so yeah, so with Wired UK. And then I also do exhibition and installation design. So the current one, um, the current, the, one of them is actually from the Venice Binale and is um, for, for Hapa Villa. So I, I, do, I do relief model and installation and just do cut paper models. Yeah, and this is for, for the, the, the hoarding at the uh, Singapore Art Museum. As well as uh, collaboration with uh, National Arts Council, as well as National Gallery. Yeah, so this is currently on show right now in the National Gallery. It's for Light Tonight. Yeah. Then, okay, of course, approaching today's theme you know, on architectural conservation, you know, Actually, there are many discourse on it, right? Um, as someone, especially for someone who actually feels very strongly for our own national identity, and as well as the different landmarks in Singapore, you know, I usually steer my design, my discussion towards um, a more um, speculative uh, trajectory, right? And then to investigate on this idea of adaptive reuse within the forgotten buildings. Yeah, so, so um, to me, right, so what better way to actually talk about conservation than to tap on people's memory, especially Singaporeans like us, right? Singapore, Singaporeans' memories on, on the memories of the people as well as, you know, how these memories, actually, these buildings actually uh, establish connective anchors or reference points to our memories so that we can kind of relate back to the building that we inhabit. Yeah, so looking into this project, you know, I'm going to be touching on three projects. So two of them are the brief one, and then the other one is actually more um, in-depth and elaborated. Okay, so these three conservation projects actually hold very dear to me and very precious to me um, because they are actually the pivot and the, the discourse in which my architecture journey actually follows through. So the first one, the first one is in, is in UK, and it's called um, the Peckham Hospice Care Home, and it's situated in, in London. So... Um, in every project that I start, right, I always start with a narrative. So narrative to me is very important. Storytelling, the imagination and the power, the power of, of bringing narrative into your built environment and then try to relate it back to the, the users and the, the public and the inhabitants. So um, one of these projects was about a hospice program. So I was looking into the, the idea of dying, you know, creating a drawing, a narrative of, of, of death and a theme park for death itself. And trying to allow the um, young people to experience death in terms of a theme park. Of course, what I do is, is um, more speculative and it's more towards the narrative approach. So um, what I did was, um, this, this, this are a row of arm houses in UK. So they are actually supposed to be demolished. But going on site, I realized that the site is actually very beautiful and, and the, the culture and the people are actually happily inhabiting all these spaces and sharing the, the garden spaces as well. So demolishing it will be a pity, right? So I went on and then I tried to talk to some of the residents, you know, try to see how I can um, create an interior makeup of a hospice for, for, the, for the, 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 the dying because a lot of them are actually dying in the, in the, the space and then to create a, a better environment as they as they pass on especially with the shell of the of the conserve facade so of course we in architecture project we always do sectional cuts you know and this is what um, my interpretation and my proposal was to create a, a duality of privacy plus community living and then I do relief models as well so this relief sectional model is actually to show the internal makeups of a hospice in the shell of a conserved uh, facade. So um, this model was actually exhibited in RA, um, and then it got the Architecture Room Prize. Basically, it's just to show how the facades are able to be moved 
you know, even through conservation, the facade is still able to be moved and still be um, reused in, the, in a very adaptive way. Then, of course, um, um, we, I, I was working on this architecture drawing to depict the different spatial qualities of isolation plus community living within a conservation site. Right, so this drawing kind of portrays you know, the symbolism and the poetic presence of domesticating death while on a collective array of conservation uh, houses. Right, but um, actually this is a discursive discourse which we'll, I will not touch on today, you know, it's about dying well. But this, this drawing actually won um, the Archite Architecture Drawing Prize from World Architecture Festival and was uh, exhibited in Soon Museum in London. Yeah, the next project, which I'm going to touch on as well, is actually located in, uh, in Estonia. So, this project is actually cited in uh, a convent called the Purita Ruins, right? And it's uh, the offskirt of, uh, of Estonia. And for me, it's a quite an important project because it's about a, a, a demolished chapel and they, they want to demolish it and they want to re rebuild a new development onto this site. But to me, actually, you know, I'm taking from a Echo, you know, 1986, you know, he says that architecture has long been a common and prevalent means of giving a commemorative presence to memory, right? So this is especially true in Estonia, you know, when a nation with a history of oppression, you know, from foreign, land, from foreign hands that sometimes has come close to cultural extinction. Yeah, so remembering in this space, right, and forgetting is actually quite a social and highly politicized uh, process. Lah. So therefore, um, my design approach, right, was about, um, was about a neurological research center that is proposed where the care and maintenance of the historical chapel becomes a vehicle for neurological therapy. Right, so the building actually acts as a carer through the act of being cared for. Right, with a series of living laboratories at the site. Right, um, so the, the users and the inhabitants actually had cultivated the ground, preserved, the, preserved and maintained parts of the building while crafting new uh, components within it. So these are some of the technical aspects of it. <laughs> and therefore, right, neurological connection and memories are actually giving presence through the act of conservation and caring for the ruins. This is just a, a, a render piece. La. It's a, more of a narrative and a prospect proposal of what it could look like. And you know, this hybrid approach may be a typology or a prototype for an alternate um, pattern for future development in architecture. So allowing new and old users to forge new memories while giving the space to breathe as well. Okay, the, the third project, okay, that I'm going to touch on is actually one of the more important projects that um, I hold really dearly to because it's situated in Singapore, it's cited in Singapore and it's, it's, on, it's on Golden Mile Complex. So I was in UK when, when I heard the news that Golden Mile Complex was going to be demolished. So being an enthusiast of, for conservation, um, therefore I actually tried to work out a proposal uh, about adaptive reuse within Godama Complex. Yeah, so my, my title is called uh, The Metabolist Regeneration of a Dimension Nation. So um, it's actually a critique on how Singaporeans uh, are actually, how Singaporeans are actually dementia patients themselves, both physically and metaphorically, and we tend to forget about our roots and our national identity because when I ask my friend, you know, uh, oh, Gunama Complex is going to be demolished, you know, what do you think about it? They were like, they were like oh, it, well, it's common, you know, it's common in Singapore, you know, the only constant in Singapore is change. You cannot, you cannot, you cannot, um, you cannot escape, you know, this, this tendency. So, to me, when I heard this from a Singaporean, it tried to, tried to hurt me quite bad, lah, because especially living in the UK for the, eight, for the whole eight years, every time I come back to Singapore, the whole scene just started changing. So, in, in terms of problems arise in Singapore, one of them is actually um, the aging population, and the other one is in the name of progress, right? Many of the places in Singapore are actually threatened with demolition, right? So, this is actually pertinent to Singaporeans quite, 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 um, quite largely because, you know, our architecture actually forms a very solid part of our identity. 
So as of this year, right? Actually, not as of this year. This this year has been probably like two or three years ago. You know, in our short history of fifty years of nation building, more than eighty sites have already been demolished, and the eighty sites are all um, during our post independence. Yep. So this is one of the one of the this is a Pearl Bank apartment. You know, it's being demolished, and the next one is a Dakota Crescent, right? Then of course Golden Mile Complex, you know. Um, how Golden Mile Complex is is um, is important because um, it's actually one of the first mixed use. It's not it's actually my so Golden Mile Complex is actually one of the first mixed use uh, residential buildings in Singapore. It's built in 1973 to remove squatters and is an exemplary type of mega structure described by the architectural historian. Right? So um, I think for me, Hiko Maki actually called Godama Complex as a collective form, you know, where it propagates high density usage and diversity under a broad range of ideas uh, advanced by the Japanese metabolists. So, um, of course, starting my project, right, I always start with a narrative proposition, and this drawing is called the Memory Haven. I'm not really sure if it, it's clear. But basically, it's a sample size of Singapore with all its forgotten memories and demolished buildings being created in a controlled environment. And this bubble is there, the bubble within is there to hold its memory safe while the world on the outside is, continues to evolve. So it's actually a sectional cut. I'm not really sure if you can see it. It's a sectional cut of a circular bubble world while on the exterior, the, the world continues to evolve you know, into the future. So, but of course, this is a fine example of an archetypical um, um, utopian dystopian world la. but right we, we won't we won't have to build this <laughs> hopefully we don't have to build this so in designing a building i know i focus on three aspects you know singapore, one of them is actually singapore is actually, actually consciously green right we're always greening our buildings and emphasize on the environmental sustainability with, within the built environment the next one is actually the to retain the golden mile complex uh, for start I think to me that's quite important, especially what do you retain or you know, what do you actually change, what do you retain. I think that's one thing that um, we have to decide and have to draw this line. Then of course, the next one I'm trying to introduce, you know, the idea of the void deck spatial qualities, which is actually a special design feature in Singapore. Because especially right now in Singapore, you know, the void deck is actually being demolished as well, kind of demolished. They have really shifted it up to the mid-level mid deck. Yeah, so... So to me, a void deck is actually a true depiction, almost a true depiction of a kampong living. La. And I want to bring this idea of a communal living back into the space. And looking at how void deck actually represents the extension of our home. Right? You know how void deck is, uh, is for the Chinese funeral, it will be a procession out from the home. While for the Malay wedding, it's actually an invitation and welcoming of the groom and bride into the family. So this idea of the extension of the home is very important to me and this concept. So linking both concept of metabolism and the void that it creates this evolving structure that is inserted into the void um, of Golden Mile Complex and allowing uh, flexibility and future expansion of the space. So you can see, right, as an example of a long sectional cut, this, this hand-drawn. So on the long sectional cut section, you can see, you know, how the usage of the atrium, the ground level, you know, we introduce forgotten memories that are demolished and then and reconstructed, rebuilt, and inserted into the void deck spaces of Guatemala Complex. Of course, this is a speculative project. La. It will never be built like this, but we will never know. So, so this is just an example, you know, how, how different shop houses or those forgotten memories that we, we tear down in the future are being invited into the Guatemala Complex. So therefore, Guatemala Complex becomes the vessel in which to hold this exhibit collectively, forming a repository of memories and reference for us Singaporeans, actually. Yeah, this is the short section. So, um, so and for, for, this, for this project, actually, I actually did a film, right? The whole, the, whole, the whole project, actually, the film actually tells the story and narrates the story of, of residents within Golden Mile Complex. So I actually focus more on, the Golden Mile, on residents instead of the Thai community. So um, the next thing I'm actually focusing on is the greening on, of the, the void deck spaces, right? So this is just an example, a test, 
a test to see how we can actually green the whole, whole mid-level deck in Golden Mount Complex. Of course, this is another discourse and another discussion for later on. Right? You know, in, incorporating the demolished Malayan within uh, Golden Mount Complex. You know, this is very speculative. You know, the one that in Sentosa, but I, know, I think that was super big, so it would not, never not fit. <laughs> yeah, so looking into, um, looking into this, this, this part, what, I, what I'm trying to do is actually to retain the, the swimming pool at the side, if you can see, and then um, to reintroduce the leaf core and then the, the site assess as well, the different connection to the different levels, especially, and then green spaces and, and adding a restaurant at the back and the cafe. So the most important thing is actually the circulation core in the middle, right? So I'm trying to conserve that and retain that. And then of course, um, introduction, introduction of the memory walkway, creating memory gardens and especially um, this kampong white deck adaptable pots within the, the space. So all these are very speculative. La and how all these are actually connected within the different levels. Then of course, the, the, the residential area, there will be um, metabolism, will be all portable and prefabricated and will be inserted based on the different users and inhabitants' needs. Yeah, so this is like one row, kind of a row of houses. So the units actually developed with the idea of a group form, right? You know, whereby individual buildings or architectural elements will come together to form very coherent, but very flexible ensembles, you know, true linkages of technology and uh, nature, right? So some of, this, uh, some of these linkages are, were actually left to be open, if you can see at the side, right? They were left to be open so to connect with the not yet um, conceived future structure. Right, so so in, in order to in, incorporate a degree of flexibility to allow for future urban expansion, I think that to me is very important. You know, the, 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 the flexibility for users to, to decide on what they want in their own um, in home, own home in the future. Then of course, you know, you, the, the, the good thing about Gudama Complex is this terraced um, residential inhabit, inhabitants. Um, and somehow or another, you know, residents are able to look fully up to the sky as they lie on the, on the balcony. So to me, that's quite important as well. So of course, uh, no, we, um, we always come up with um, the idea of the, uh, uh, a proposal in terms of a drawing, you know, like to show the different spaces in terms of the void deck spaces, followed by the mid garden deck, and then the residential at the top. So this project, um, won a few awards as well. You know, not only do, do they won do they won the architecture drawing festival again, and then also won the red dot, and was one of the. Um, there's a term. Was one best of the. Best. Was best of the best, but also was selected to be one of the lumin luminary awards. Yeah, so I was. I'm very privileged to be able to achieve that la. So and then of course this this project also gained a lot of tractions after that. You know, a lot of people, a lot of media starts to come and talk about it and then to start to start off a discussion about it. And I think that's very important in terms of our designers, in terms of designers and, and the people of Singaporeans, the people of Singapore, you know, how we can create this discussion online and then try to see how we can approach uh, re-adaptive reuse of old buildings as well as conservation. So I have a short um, trailer for the film. Uh, I'm not sure it's... Yeah. <laughs> Yep. So the full film will be actually shown in the Vmail. So this is just a short trailer. So if you guys are interested, and I have an Instagram account, you guys can follow. It's, it's, it's right there on the top. Yeah. Thank you, guys. Thanks, Jerome. Uh, so just now, Jerome looked at me when he uh, talked about the award because uh, just to share an anecdote, in Singapore, the design community is very small. It's one degree of separation. 
So I was judging for Red Dot, uh, this uh, Germany Award. It's one of the most prestigious design award uh, for any creative. And uh, Jerome uh, entered the award and I was uh, judging it and I saw this work. I was in the architectural um, and spatial category and it blew my mind. I mean, come on, look at this piece of work, right? And I thought, wow, if the Singapore design uh, the future we have is in the hands of all these talented and thoughtful designers. We are in good hands. So I push it for the Luminary Award, which is the top award, and I literally like sold my soul for this boy. <laughs> Uh, so I'm, I'm glad he did, he did well, he won the best of the best. We didn't get the luminary, but uh, it, it's out of thousands of awards, we only have five shortlists for luminary. So that's good enough because managed to convince uh, the whole jury of like 30 people that this is a really talented boy and we need to recognize that. So that's how I know Jerome, and the next thing I know, I invited him to La Salle, where I'm teaching part-time to give a talk, and we hit it off, we are good friends now, and uh, here he is leaving for me to give this talk on a Friday night. <laughs> so another round of uh, applause for Jerome. Yeah. Okay, so uh, coming up next, also just to share an anecdote before uh, I introduce uh, the next speaker. Um, Studio Lapis is uh, made up of Kalin and Wing Hin, and we also went, uh, went through an interesting time together. So a few years ago, they, uh, they, they, they were researching on the modernist and postmodernist architecture in Singapore, a lot of which are being demolished at an uh, unacceptable rate in Singapore. And so this two person with uh, two of their friends, uh, with Dinesh Naidu, they uh, took it upon themselves to document all the modernist and postmodernist architecture in Singapore. And they went around Singapore with no help, literally ground up, documenting every of this building. And of course, we should give credit to uh, Jeremy Sun, the photographer who unfortunately passed on from cancer, who went with them and documented all these uh, buildings on their own. And uh, Jeremy and me are good friends. So Jeremy came to me and said that we need a book designer. <laughs> so this is how, uh, in a very uh, funny sort of way, I got connected to Kalin and Wing Hin. And we, uh, we pushed through and we published this book called Our Modern Past. Uh, if you haven't seen the book, uh, please get a copy because it's the blood and sweat of... Uh, Kalin, uh, Kalin Wing Hin, Dinesh, and Jeremy, who did this for over 10 years, the documenting, you know, on their own accord. Um, so, uh, if you haven't seen it, it's a really an amazing book. Of course, I designed it, lah, so quite nice, you know. Yeah, so, anyway, so uh, now I'm going to, with that, we're going to have uh, Ho Wing Hin from Studio Lapis. Uh, Wing Hin is, of course, uh, one of the founders of Studio Lapis. He graduated with a master's in architecture in NUS and went on to specialize in the study of architectural conservation in the Uni University of Gen Genova in Italy. And uh, Studio Lapis is a Singapore-based architectural conservation specialist consultancy, probably the first, uh, with local and overseas projects. They provide specialist advice for all stages of conservation and adaptive reuse projects, from feasibility studies through design strategies to engaging builders in resto uh, restoration works. They also offer support on the long-term conservation, management, maintenance and repairs of historical building fabric. Very, very specialised. Uh, how did they even survive in a you know, country like Singapore? So let's hear from... Wing Hin Studio Lapis. Uh, round of applause for him. Thanks, uh, Kelly, for the nice introduction, and thank you, everyone, and Constantino, uh, for having me here. Uh, to this evening, I'm very happy to share some thoughts on um, uh, heritage practice and advocacy. I'm actually wearing two hats tonight. Uh, both as a partner of Studio Lapis and also a chair of Tokomomo Singapore. So my talk, my sharing will be in two 
bought parts. But uh, before that, I also would like to uh, express my gratitude to the team uh, behind Studio Lapis. It's not just myself and uh, Carlin. It's really uh, our dedicated team. Uh, two of them are sitting there now. And of course, uh, my equally passionate colleagues in, uh, who formed Dokomomo Singapore together with uh, Carlin and myself. Yeah. So the sharing today is called uh, Brick by Brick, Layer by Layer. Uh, which kind of embody the core values. Uh, the, the in, in fact, the name Studio Lapis uh, has a special meaning for us. Uh, lapis meaning layer in Malay, layers of history, layers of memory. And uh, Lapis also means a stone, a precious stone of a monument in Latin, which acknowledged uh, my uh, initiation into the world of uh, heritage conservation uh, in Italy. So uh, we'll, we'll just cover three uh, broad topics, um, uh, charting some uh, key uh, projects that of uh, our office and uh, uh, Dokmo Singapore is involved in. Uh, first, teaching labor in the city. Second is uh, power rehabilitation, and third one is um, progressive once more, which talks about the Dokomo, uh, work of Dokmo. Um, so this is. Um, uh, I think probably some of you know uh, the site, um, South Beach. Uh, in, in fact, it's the, the launching project for our firm. Uh, we were very fortunate to um, be appointed as the conservation consultant, uh, working alongside the designers, um, Foster and Partners, and uh, the architect aiders. Uh, this is the old Beach Road camp, uh, which is a key uh, military site uh, along Beach Road, just right across uh, Raffles Hotel. Uh, you can see here, and uh, it comprises four buildings. Um, the NCO Club occupies a corner with the old drill hall, block 14 and block 1. Yeah. Uh, this is an important, I mean, a meaningful, I guess, also a typical, I would say typical project, uh, but it really marked a different phase in Singapore's urban conservation because uh, we are talking about keeping buildings of uh, significance and allowing intensification on the same plot of land. Now, this model of urban regeneration uh, really kicked in uh, uh, a decade ago when you look at places like Far East Square and Chinese Square. But those are at the scale of uh, shop house blocks. Not like this, uh, where this is really a huge site, uh, more than uh, 20,000 square meters keeping four small buildings that front Beach Road because of urban conservation reasons and allowing developers to go up to 34-storey uh, towers. So how did uh, the designers actually mitigate the jump in scale is through this canopy that if you walk through uh, the promenade today, uh, you will see that the canopy covers the, the street and tries to hide part of the buildings, the tall buildings behind. Yeah. So we actually, uh, as conservation consultants, we advise a team, uh, we work with a big team um, to integrate, explore how to integrate building into wider urban fabric, um, reinstating some of the hidden uh, elements of the historical building. And uh, through, the, through years, we found that these buildings were modified till their true character has been uh, hidden. Yeah. So we try to uh, remove those detractive elements that uh, uh, you know, uh, allow us to appreciate architecture, uh, historic design, and most importantly, how to introduce sympathetic design interventions within each building. So these are the key ideas. And uh, one of the examples of how, I guess, uh, the old and the new were interpreted in this scheme is the drill hall. Uh, this is a 1935 uh, building, 1930s pre-war building, which is an interior drill hall, more used for military ceremonies than training. Um, and this is a section across the site where the uh, one part of it is actually not conserved and it's allowed the developer to have it removed and the designer very early on introduced the new entrance to the rear after removing this. So in the sense of the uh, architecture, is actually an uh, art deco architecture. Uh, how the architect has tried to distinguish itself is thoroughly modern. Of course, uh, it may not be to everyone's uh, 
uh, liking. Okay, but it is one of the more striking examples of uh, distinguishing the old and the new, and I'm sure John Francois will have something to say about the Venice Charter later on. Okay. Uh, what's more interesting is the interior, uh, which, because it's going to be the ballroom of the hotel, um, we have to fulfill the uh, seating capacity, and there is nowhere else uh, that is uh, able to expand the hall uh, unless you do it externally. So if you uh, it will, but it will block the facades of the building. So, in the end, uh, a lightweight platform is introduced. Uh, this actually directly challenged the URA uh, conservation guidelines, but the design team and us worked uh, to minimize the visual impact and the structural impact of this platform, detaching it from the existing parabolic arches and using very tiny uh, section columns to rest the platform. So it got approved and built. Okay, so today, um, this is actually a quite a, uh, you know, a new mixed-use quarter in the uh, center of the city. Okay? And the vision was really to respect and retain the front, which actually is a memorial site for World War II, while much of the new is kept away from public view when you walk along uh, Beach Road. Uh, the second project that was very important um, is uh, capital development, which we um, worked together with uh, RMP and Architect 61, uh, which has three uh, important historical buildings on the site. Uh, the Capital, Capital Theatre Theater being the focus, Capital, Capital Building and Stanford, Stanford House. House. And the, the idea, idea is to in introduce, inject a residential and commercial podium uh, into this urban fabric. So according to RMP, they took the uh, inspiration from Siena, okay, the campo uh, of the Siena. Now what I want to talk about really is the ground level experience or how the back lanes were kind of transformed um, into uh, activity lane. Okay, so previously it was a back lane okay, behind the Capitol building. Uh, the idea is to actually activate spaces around Capital Theatre. Uh, it used to be that there are push carts and hawkers also uh, selling stuff here. So what was done is actually a careful insertion of uh, two-story units that uh, respected the void uh, opening between the finger blocks, as well as being uh, sufficiently set back from the street. So again, it embodied the uh, ultra-modern insertion that was quite popular in uh, architecture uh, uh, design in the early 2000s. So these are two quite important projects. Uh, I mean, uh, uh, this, these are the two uh, sites. Now, I want to focus a little on the Capital Theatre, uh, which was really the highlight of the project. Now, uh, in all photographs that we managed to research uh, and retrieve, uh, we saw that it looked nothing like what we see in 2010 when the team entered the building, which is everything is clad in uh, acoustic lining, right? So we uh, got the contractor to remove this cladding and see what's underneath. And it was first uh, happiness, but later on it was shock because uh, much of the architectural elements have been partially destroyed when they tried to install the strip uh, paneling, right? It wasn't a conserved building in the earlier days until uh, quite recently. So the team had to really study what are the best way to do it because this theater had a big role to fill. It need to be a multi-purpose functional venue where it can host dinners, wedding dinners, uh, corporate lunch, can host a live theater performance, and it can also host a conventional cinema events. Okay. So with all these requirements uh, added onto the very delicate historic fabric, uh, it was no easy challenge to balance it out so that there are still, you know, it is still very recognizably capital theater. Uh, we're trying to recover the, some of the past, uh, you know, uh, architectural expression while trying to introduce changes. So these are some of the studies uh, our studio uh, advise the team on to actually uh, restore the interiors. So um, 
through time we evolve an approach, uh, what we call the custodian approach to managing change because to us conservation is really about, it's not about preventing change or freezing time. It's about uh, taking a principled approach to allow change to happen in a way that is sensitive to the uh, history and memory of the site. Right? So these are the five principles, preserving the layers, dialogue between the old and the new, we try to reuse, uh, upcycle historic elements uh, as far as possible and any intervention we feel that it should uh, be uh, reversible and compatible and in the end, uh, most importantly, any intervention we need to really try to find a way to sync with the historical fabric rather to impose a standard solution to find the best fit. So next project uh, I, I move on to is the uh, 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 St. James Power Station, which is uh, recently completed. Uh, it um, now houses the uh, headquarters, global headquarters of Dyson. And uh, in this project, we tried something really quite uh, differently uh, in terms of material conservation and trying to tell the stories of the site uh, through different means, eh? uh, heritage implementation. So this is um, the photo of what it looks like today um, and a brief history. Suffice to say that uh, it was actually finished, uh, completed in uh, 1927 as a coal-fired power station. So they use uh, coal. And uh, after the war, it was converted to gas turbine. Okay? It uses oil. And later on, uh, it was a warehouse in the 1990s and it was empty for a uh, few years before it was transformed into a uh, uh, night spot, uh, what Singapore's first uh, integrated multi-venue night spot. Uh, those, some of you might be familiar with Dragonfly and you know, all the places that this was quite famous. But this is really uh, the second life. You know, uh, it was uh, built for machines and later used as a warehouse and this is the first time it accommodated people. Right? But it was a very different kind of uh, imagination of the space. Um, and by the time uh, we are involved in the project, it had a very different new use. That means it needs to become a corporate office. Right? So these are key challenges uh, faced by the entire team. Uh, we work on this uh, with uh, W Architects and uh, other uh, key consultants. And how to adapt a night spot or even an industrial building to become an office is one key thing. Uh, while respecting a historic character, obviously, how do you add the new floor areas? Yeah. The second one is to look at the material fabric, that means the brickwork and the steel. Uh, in the past, there was some work done on it and it was not uh, uh, you know, very compatible. And therefore, we had to uh, kind of undo some of this. Right. So in terms of adaptation, um, we had to, uh, the team had to navigate the high volume spaces uh, of course, I mentioned the new floor areas. Uh, it was actually introduced as uh, floating decks. Later, you can, you can show some uh, images that you can see more clearly. And trying to re bring back the daylight. So this top image is uh, when it looked like a nightclub, when it was used as a nightclub with uh, many windows blocked out and the whole interior painted black. Okay. Uh, how to bring back daylight in the space, how to deal with the age structure, the steel skeleton, Okay, so this is the end, uh, I mean, uh, uh, the outcome. Of course, without Dyson's interiors work, uh, you can see that uh, it very clearly allowed the steel structure and the roof to be fully appreciated. And the new floor areas, uh, adding up to uh, more than 10,000 square meters, had to be inserted quite carefully and some parts of it had to basically back away from the large windows to allow the light to penetrate the interior. Okay. And it was decided very early on to allow, uh, not add any more uh, loading onto the columns, but introduce a secondary system of columns, which totally blended in with the new addition. You can see these are the white columns that are actually carrying the loads of these uh, floor decks. And, uh, Interestingly, through our historical research, um, in day, day one of the building, the building was not full volume. It had decks, it had staircases, it had to accommodate machinery. So this became a kind of reference 
for the design team and, and also for the conservation team to uh, ima reimagine the space. Uh, on exterior, um, I mentioned before we had to. Uh, this was the first. This is the first project that the team had to deal with uh, fair face brickwork on such a massive scale. I think more than uh, maybe five thousand square meters of fair face brickwork, uh, and it really stretched the uh, uh, capability and and also the 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 the, the uh, 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 I was saying patience of the team to deal with uh, the condition of the fabric. Now, not forgetting this is a coal fire fire station. There are a lot of soot on the surface. Right. But it was very early on uh, we decided not to overclean the building right? because it will, look, uh, it will lose all its character if it looks brand new. And the suit also is a patina of its history that we wanted to still be able to be appreciated. Right. So this is a process where the brickwork repairs uh, were carefully uh, studied, the brickwork condition. Uh, we devise a systematic way of categorizing the different kind of situation uh, which needed uh, then uh, different treatments. Okay? For example, some parts where there are cracks, it needs stitching. Other parts we found that uh, there's some patching done, it needs to be kind of removed because these are actually harming the brick. Right? So, what we told the client uh, is that, uh, uh, I mean, it, at the end of the day, we were fortunate that most of the brickwork uh, are still okay, except for some that need to be replaced because they have lost too much material. Yeah. So we, we, we then have a, a much more uh, textured surface than some of these um, uh, cosmetic treatments that were uh, done in the past. Okay, some images of uh, before and after. Uh, within the interiors, you can see uh, there were a lot of additional members added into the structure to put in the lighting rig for the discotheques and the nightclub. Yeah. And all these are removed and the original uh, steel uh, structure uh, is now very clearly seen. Okay. So it was actually kind of... Uh, used as a large volume space uh, in at least block A uh, without much, cons I would say uh, the surrounding, how it looked wasn't important because it's just a very large space, right? I and mean, then most people and go, to, go to the place in, at night. So obviously the challenge then is uh, when it becomes a building when uh, people work in the day, uh, what do you do, right? So besides uh, clarifying the architectural uh, uh, characteristic, uh, that was also the uh, very important uh, aspect of the design work uh, that the architect had to undertake. So this is night view of the monument. Yes, so I'm uh, now going to talk about a slightly different uh, aspect of the work we did on the site, which is telling the stories of the building that, you know, um, uh, wouldn't, wouldn't be very appreciated if it is not, uh, you know, uh, interpreted properly. So uh, the owner, uh, Maple Tree, wanted to relocate a few of its uh, maritime artifacts that were salvaged from different parts of old Capel Harbour um, and, and the old uh, Harbour of Singapore, new Harbour of Singapore, and relocate all of them onto this site. All right? So this presented the opportunity for us to curate the heritage trail using these artifacts, which really were quite mixed and quite rojak. You know, we have a harpoon gun from uh, a, a, a Russian whaling ship. We have a steel anchor of unknown origin, uh, probably manufactured in the UK. We have stone posts. Okay? We have a, a very old 1850 stone post from the, one of the old docks. And we have two cast iron uh, metal posts. So, we had to come up with uh, themes to explain the stories and how these elements fit into the larger theme. So some of the ideas, the stories, tie, uh, talk about the larger story of Singapore being a trading post, trading hub, therefore having a large uh, variety of uh, imported materials, uh, and also Singapore's uh, history as a port city. Uh, and this uh, 1890 steam crane is really the crown, the jewel that allows people to appreciate that. And these are some of the uh, process work 
uh, we try to actually uh, restore the material integrity of the artifacts and work with designers um, to curate and uh, basically orchestrate a journey that allows people to read about the history of, this, of these uh, artifacts. Okay. We also have a heritage gallery inside the chimney uh, itself. Uh, this is actually quite an interesting space. It's all of 3.6 meters diameter. And it was really a challenge to squeeze display panels, artifacts into such a compressed space. So uh, the designers, uh, we told, tried to uh, expand it a bit by pushing some of the designs, uh, the curatorial uh, content into the entrance area, which is the kind of for the, the ingress area to the museum. So we have these different teams which we focus on the people behind the uh, power station, uh, talking about the site itself and trying to use the chimney. It's very dramatic space. Uh, it's more than, uh, I think, 20 meters high. Um, to really bring people uh, it, to a very focused, uh, 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 immersive environment. So this is what you will see when you enter the, um, the doors. Okay? Uh, the main panel, the main display, which is a larger story of St. Jane Power Station transformation through time. And here we have uh, Jerome's uh, masterpiece uh, that he briefly showed. Uh, we were actually quite uh, fortunate to have a supportive uh, owner who, well, we only show your Peckham Hospice paper card, which was A4 size. So they ask whether you can do two meters by one meters, right? So you all must go there and have a look, right? Because it really is unimaginable that oh, one person did all this, you know? Uh, and it's very, uh, 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 it actually has also uh, AR and VR, uh, uh, technology embedded onto it. So when you put your mobile device over some areas, you can see how the steam power station worked when it was first built in 1927. Right? So this is the only space where uh, someone, a uh, visitor, can understand you know, what uh, difference it made, uh, you know, uh, what was the original space like before it became a nightclub and became uh, today's uh, corporate offices. Now I come to the last part of my sharing, uh, which also uh, coincidentally tie in with what Jerome was sharing earlier on. And now it's uh, about uh, Singapore's modern uh, architecture, uh, uh, protection and conservation of modern architecture. Now we, a group of uh, like-minded friends and colleagues formed uh, the Singapore chapter of DOCOMOMO, which stands for Documentation and Conservation of Building Sites and Neighbourhoods of the Modern Movement, not to be mixed up with the Japanese uh, telco DOCOMO. Uh, they sound very similar. Uh, we are a non-profit group that uh, tries to educate and advocate for uh, conservation of modern heritage. And it makes a lot of sense for Singapore uh, that uh, we have to pay attention to this most threatened category of heritage because we are a modern city and a young country. So check us out on the, our website, which is uh, a work in progress. Um, and these are some of the mission. Uh, we actually value, uh, we look at buildings that are under threat. We value exchange of ideas. Uh, we Im Importantly, we want to actually inculcate uh, responsibility towards uh, the more recent architectural inheritance. Yeah. And these are some of the key um, arguments we, we make uh, in uh, evaluating some of the best uh, examples of modernist uh, design in Singapore. And you can see in this book published by the URA in 2005, by 2021, more than half is gone, right? And uh, a few are threatened, not yet gone, but not safe. But finally, we have a building that is conserved, of course, uh, at least uh, physically, all right? So that is actually one of the major milestones. And uh, we really started becoming uh, more focused as a group uh, triggered by the demolition of Pearl Bank. Uh, so a uh, few of us came in to carry out an uh, independent feasibility study to look at whether, you know, and what it takes to repurpose this building for other use rather than tear it down and build small shoebox apartments. 
uh, which is currently the case. So we try to actually involve a uh, few stakeholders and we, uh, for its proximity to the Singapore General Hospital uh, and also the surroundings, uh, Chinatown, you have a heritage site. You also have a, a Pearl, Pearl Hills Park, a very nice uh, green site. We feel that actually it can carry a multi-generational uh, living environment uh, with a focus on assisted living. So it's for seniors who doesn't want to be in a nursing home. Uh, they are still mobile, reasonably active, and they still want to be part of the action. Right. So that's why the city centre actually uh, is a good location for them. And what's more, in the future, uh, Outram MRT station will become a uh, main interchange for four metro lines. Right? So this is something we felt had it going uh, for the building. And of course, uh, we were a little late because we, we started our work uh, after the sale was concluded and uh, uh, it has been transacted. So we were racing against time and at the same time we were doing uh, op-ed pieces that uh, got published in uh, national press. This is the very first one that kind of um, was published in Business Times and it presented a position that Dokomomo Singapore uh, took in terms of Singapore's identity is so much tied to it as a modern, young and modern country. And unlike other cities in Europe and in North America, we have never suffered an urban crisis. And therefore, and we did not find modern architecture alienating. Right? Most of us grow up in HDB towns. You know, in the, since independence. So this is uh, the, the main argument. And, and we were looking at basically the meaning of keeping this, uh, what it means for Singapore. Uh, we started a petition uh, uh, led by uh, architect Mo Wei Wei, and it elicited a surprising range of uh, responses, not just from designers, but from teachers, from students, from even housewives. Uh, and this actually came quite uh, uh, eloquently from, from a non-designer. So you can see that people actually feel a connection to some of these buildings. And this is the book that uh, Kelly mentioned. Uh, the few of us worked for it uh, for, for a decade. That in this interesting way, we could also use this, you know, um, the knowledge gained from researching and writing the book in to argue for the uh, preservation of these buildings. Um, so this is um, a major conference we organize uh, that talks about architecture in Southeast Asia. So it is not just a problem for Singapore. A lot of Asian cities, high-rise, uh, compact, dense, rapid, uh, high uh, commercial pressures to redevelop. We wanted to bring together speakers from different countries, share experiences, and an expert panel. Uh, who have actually done uh, go, went through the same journey uh, before, right? And this was really um, fortunate. We we're fortunate to have a lot of compatriots um, and the support of even the uh, Minister of National Development. He was hosted in uh, the URA Center. So I think there was kind of an agreement uh, even within the government that it is time to look at saving other buildings after losing uh, Pearl Bank, right? So this is actually a student's exhibition that um, the committee, uh, exhibition committee put together and this is one of the student work presenting the uh, vision of the different uh, version of a conserved uh, Godemal complex. So we were finally uh, uh, accepted as a uh, Singapore chapter in uh, 2020. This is a snapshot of uh, the document we had to prepare to show that we are serious as a group to uh, promote uh, the modern heritage. Um, okay, besides uh, advocacy, we feel that uh, outreach is important to basically bring people into some of these amazing spaces. This is uh, Pasir Panjang Power Station, 1950s. Uh, British design, uh, now empty. Um, uh, we also had uh, the architect, one of the architects of Godema Complex giving a tour of the building. And this is uh, uh, really a gem of a modernist house designed in the 1970s by uh, one of Singapore's pioneer architects, Lee Kip Lin, who is also uh, taught in the NUS Department of Architecture. So his son actually was very keen when he heard about our activities and 
he uh, allowed us to host a tour of the house, which is still quite remarkably intact. Right. So uh, there are lots and lots uh, we can we, we need to do, and uh, I, I do hope some of you. Uh, sorry to hijack the talk as a <laughs> platform for this, but I do hope some of you check out our website, uh, uh, .sg. Uh, we have a map which we try to place 100 Singapore buildings on the map, right? And uh, it is still very much a work in progress. We have about populated about uh, 40 buildings, okay? And uh, each point, uh, you can pull out some information, and you'll click on this button, there will be a page that talks about it in more detail. So there are actually uh, about 40 building biographies in the website and other kind of content like essays and, and uh, uh, photographs, things like that. Now the last part, uh, beyond uh, conserving or preserving or retrofitting large concrete buildings, uh, to preserve cultural heritage. Uh, there is a wider meaning to it because uh, we are looking at the climate crisis and uh, it is a time when um, design professionals should think about how their work can help in mitigating it. Right? So one area is actually looking at heritage, looking at preserving, uh, not preserving buildings, but retrofitting buildings instead of instinctively wanting to tear down and rebuild. And uh, these are some of the international movements, Climate Heritage Network, Retro First in the UK and in Singapore, uh, architects have banded together to sign uh, this uh, declaration of climate and biodiversity emergency. Right? So imagine uh, this is our second uh, position paper we just got published in 2020. So our argument is beyond keeping buildings for cultural and social value, we should able to look at them as environmental capital, right? Because material waste, con uh, embodied energy in large complicated buildings is big if we try to remove it, okay? And then we can actually reduce our contribution to the crisis. So what we wish actually uh, beyond conservation is to consider this large mega structure as reservoir of carbon emission. Right? You, you contain them, you do not need to release them back to the environment. You make changes to it, and then you give them a new lease of life. And because Singapore is such a hyper-dense and high-rise country, especially in the city centre and its HDB estate, uh, we also have a large store of ageing concrete buildings, because now they have hit 50 years, those buildings built in the 60s. We have great potential to imagine it uh, reimagine and sustainably uh, retrofit these buildings. Of course, uh, one of the great news uh, we hear uh, last year was that finally, after many people coming together to persuade uh, stakeholders, the government, um, finally, the uh, government has uh, conserved Kodamao complex. Then the work has only just begun. You can see read about it in the, in the news yesterday that the owners accepted the offer, although it's $100 million less, but they can see that there's only one offer coming up, right? So we hope that uh, all eyes will be on this building because it will be the very first building that will demonstrate a different kind of attitude. Uh, instead of tabula rasa, can we be creative about reusing these buildings and giving them a new life and new meaning? So with that, I thank you. Now the formal introduction. John Francois Milou is the founder of Studio Milou Architecture. He's an internationally renowned architect and is well known uh, for the design work of, of course, our National Gallery Singapore. He has been a member of the French Order of Architecture since 1979 and uh, the Singapore Board of Architects since 2008, where he won the competition. Um, he leads uh, an international team of architects and designers uh, to work under his direction um, for the companies of two branches, Studio Milou Architecture Paris and Studio Milou Singapore, along with a network of consultants, including uh, landscape architects, uh, museolo museologists, museologist, yes, histo historians, uh, lighting consultants, multimedia, graphic and exhibition designers, etc. So without much further ado, John Fonsoir.
<coughs> so I, I, uh, I will do something which is a um, bit more focused on what is really to uh, conserve a building, what is really to uh, uh, your attitude as a designer uh, when you have to uh, play or to deal with an existing building. I will focus on this. We've done a few projects all over the world, but I will focus on this one because it's a complex one. It's the one you know. And in this, in, this, in this project, you will see what is at stake when you do something in this kind of a building. And I will talk about layering. And layering is an uh, old building you see in, uh, let's say especially in Europe, are layers of walls and building and stone and so on, and of different time. But, uh, uh, as good designer, we sh should think when you do this kind of well, what is the, the good way of layering things, you know? So we'll talk about that. We'll talk about the gallery. I will try to, uh, to be uh, not lot too long, but okay, let's go. Uh, National Gallery, next one, next one, next one. The historical site, you know the site. It was a uh, city hall, Supreme Court. Everyone knows that. Facing the Padang and facing the sea. You now it's a bit different. Next one. Uh, it has been a very important monument for the Singaporean. All the, sc all the, uh, the school book of Singaporean have been, uh, have this, has this photo inside. I mean, it's an important monument, historically symbolic and so on. Next one. Uh, it has well, uh, facing the Padang, which is a place for, for the old Singaporean to come once a year, twice a year, something like that. Right? Once, let's, and next one. Uh, uh, it, uh, it has been gazetted as an historical monument with a strange uh, way of, uh, of classifying the, um, the, er the heritage, where some part were critically important to conserve, some part are important to conserve, and some part are not so important to conserve. You can, uh, you can. So we have this kind of constraint, and the next one. So it was true for the plan. Next one. Next one for two for the Supreme Court. And additionally, there was some element, next one, some element to keep. So it was a kind of a catalog of maybe 1,000 elements to keep and to protect and to restore and so on. That's kind of a conservation brief we had. Next one. Um, so when we, the, so we have the, the brief was a, very clear, it was to host the, the, uh, the major collection of painting of modern South, of modern Southeast Asia. Voilà. That was the brief. The collection was uh, the Singapore collection. It was supposed to grow. Next one. Um, and we have a functional brief, which is the traditional uh, museum functional brief. Next one. Uh, when you have different kind of space, space for very control, this less control of public, no public, you have, you have climate control, no climate control, a kind of, uh, in fact, there are four types of space in this kind of building, next one. But of course we have to be safe for in case of fire, anti-blast in case of an attack of a terrorist, I don't know. Uh, it should be a bit uh, 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 designed uh, in terms of environmental thing. It should be accessible to all. All these concerns are piling in the design. Next one. Um, and there is a bit of this kind of, uh, uh, let's say, this. Um, uh, traditional constraint in museum, the climate control, because it's very important that the art pieces are safe. Uh, you know, the loading capacity, because you sh should bring a uh, kind of sculpture or a painting, it depends, so it's a lot of, uh, sometimes, even 10 kilonewtons per square meter. And uh, the public access uh, on, one, on, on one side and the, and, and, the, and, the, and, this, and the back of ours on the other side. Next one. Uh, when we won the competition, we present this project. It was the idea of uh, having an intervention which was, in fact, visible, but not intrusive into the existing fabric of the two buildings for, for, for the National Gallery to exist and it, for the people of Singapore to recognize the, the Supreme Court and the City Hall. They are not changed, apparently, okay, from outside. Uh, 
For the people of Singapore, it was very important. The, the two buildings remained the same. Of course, the way you, you navigate in the building are not the same, but the buildings are the same. Next one. And it will, we, did, we designed this project as a, a kind of, a, a, you know, there is this kind of three layers. One is creating an extensive basement in order to re respond to the brief, which is a, a doubling the area of the, of the uh, city or the Supreme Court, in fact. And uh, uh, restoring the existing building, uh, the concept building, and creating a, a kind of roof, next one, which is the uh, uh, create a kind of uh, additional space, which are a bit different uh, compared to the space you can have in, in the building. They are a external space, but in fact, the, the, the light is tamed a bit more uh, confronting uh, than the Singaporean la the light, which is, uh, okay, I will say something which is not very nice, because the light in Singapore is not beautiful. The sky are beautiful, but the light is very confronting. It's too, uh, it's too cold, it's too harsh, and everyone is trying to escape the light. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm sorry, but everyone is going to, uh, under, yeah. So we try to create a light which is a bit more a bit more, uh, uh, let's say, warm, uh, 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 divided by two in time intensity, and to create a kind of outdoor space, which is really a pleasure to walk in. Next one. Uh, the concept was very simple. It's just, we try to sign the change with, with just a, a line. We say just a line, just a line over the building, and try to to, to uh, um, to design and to um, keep this simplicity. Next one. Of course, internally, we have to uh, create new space under this kind of line, let's say. So it, it, it creates dramatic space sometimes. And we will have to play with this kind of dramatic experience of the visit when you go from a, an inter interior to an exterior, which is uh, very high and, uh, and, and all that, all that create this kind of the fabric of the experience. Okay, next one. Um, there is three main elements in the design. Of course, there is the basement, the roof and the existing building. Next one. We talked about it already. Next one. Okay, so the, the, the basement is uh, Next one, and what I will talk now is about the layering of things. Because uh, the existing building exists, right? But the basement doesn't exist and the roof doesn't exist. Now I, I can bring this element, uh, in, and you will see, next one, that uh, oh, it's a very complex building. Uh, we talk about the basement, uh, the, the, the Supreme Court is, uh, is is founded on very, very, uh, uh, very uh, strong uh, uh, ball pile going very deep. It, it doesn't move at all. Uh, everything is moving around the, this building, but the, the building is stiff, completely stiff. It doesn't move. So the, the, the floor is, the, let's say the ground is going to be that way, but the building stays here. So for example, it is a threshold. In fact, the, the fl you, you see the the, pa the, the, pa the, the pavement uh, is going down, but the, the bu buildings stay here. The city hall is completely different. It, it's founded on shallow foundation, and it's like a boat. You know, it's just fo following the the movement of, of the soil, and it, it, because it's, it's quite heavy, it's even uh, sinking a bit in the floor. So it's a completely different opposite, uh, different thing. So. This one is stiff, this one is floating. So in fact, from this point to this point, you have two meter difference of uh, st settlement. And it's very, uh, very visible in, in the building. Next one. Okay, so there is the uh, next one, next one. So because of this, this, this piling foundation, we are only able to make a small basement and, and under, the, under the Supreme Court. Next one. Next one, but for the, the because we, the, we have shallow foundation and we should absolutely for the 
for the uh, for the gallery uh, operation of a very resistant thing, a resistant uh, building. I have to re re completely uh, redo all, uh, all the the foundation of the building. We were able to create a strong basement and a very extensive basement underneath the the city hall. Next one, and you will see here the fact that. Uh, uh, next one, you will see that the way the, the way the, the the let's say the basement is going is like sliding below without touching at all the existing building. Of course, it's an image because believe me, it's, it's not the way it is built. But the impression you have when you the, the junction between the basement and is exactly that. Of course, it's a, I, you will see it, it's a very very difficult work to do. Uh, but the impression is it's perfectly adjusted as if it's sliding uh, below. For the roof is a bit the same thing. The next one. We, next one. Yeah, next one, I don't know. Yeah, so you have exactly the same kind of attitude for the roof. The roof is, seems to have slided and, and, and being perfectly adjusted to the existing building. So the, uh, this kind of layering, taking a, it's like making a dress for a very old lady. You have to make it very, very, very well and adjust everything correctly in order for, that, for this, this, this old lady to be very beautiful. You know, this, this kind of thing. You have to, you have really, the, the relationship between the layers are very important and the geometry of it. it it's a very complex geometrical problem, in fact. Next one. And for the historical building, we are uh, creating a fully second skin inside. And again, the, the, let's say this fat wall uh, uh, adjusted very carefully uh, uh, with the existing fabric of the building. All the windows are, are respected, they are restored, and so on. Next one. So we have a bit the same thing. Next one. So the new columns are, are, are falling, and the the fat wall, and you have the, again, again the same impression of something which is sliding gently. Next one. Um, next one. And this, you see, the kind of perspective we did when we we were designing the the, the gallery. So you can see a bit the, uh, the, the intention to control the light, to have a kind of soft light, to have all this kind of uh, quality and simplicity of material, you, you, you see everywhere. We use very few material in design. Next one. Next one. Next one. Yeah, you can see here the fact that in the window, the, the fat wall is, is really uh, well adjusted. That's a, that's a drawing, of course. Next one. Of course, we did uh, when we begin to de to design and to tender, and so we did this kind of prototype of everything in order to check that it will be correct. Next one, and I will show very quickly uh, for you to understand that in this idea of sliding, it's not at all uh, what is uh, happening on site. Let's go now. So, of course, we have to create a, a, a very. Uh, uh, kind of hole in the building into, uh, to create vehicular access. Next one. We have to uh, uh, some time to, to just to prop up the entire facade in the building in order to, to, to do works inside. Uh, so it's, uh, that, uh, that is the, 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 the city hall. We cannot keep the, the floor. So we have to replace the floor. Next one. That's, that's the city hall. Next one. We have to recreate a kind of this micro piling foundation for all the foundation of the, the city hall with this kind of micro piling here. Next one. And you can see a bit this intricate things when you have to micro pile and reorganize the foundation for the entire building in order to get the, uh, the required uh, stability of the building. Next one. And sometimes we have to do here. For example, we have to keep the surrender chamber here, so we cannot. We have to, let's say, to, to uh, uh, 
to support the surrender chamber over the excavation, so it was a very complex thing. So we have to use low, uh, uh, low headroom diaphragm uh, uh, equipment to, to do the work. Next one. There is a lot of, uh, let's say, temporary structure. Next one. Next one. So you can see a bit the, intri the, the intrication of work and so on and so on. So it's this idea of sliding things, not exactly what's happening, right? That you can see a bit the beginning of connection of the new basement with the courtyard here. So you can feel a bit what's happening. Next one. Of course, in this process, we have a lot of, uh, a lot of work to do with, uh, which is more conservation uh, related. So the conservation and the, uh, of, the, uh, of the Shanghai plaster of the facade without uh, killing the, the very smooth finish of it, so it's a very difficult uh, kind of balance. Next one. Uh, we have to do the roof, redo the roof and uh, of the, the copper roof, for example, of the, uh, of the Supreme Court. Next one. Inter uh, internally, we have very often to dismantle the entire wood finish in order to bring all the services behind and to rebring the, uh, the, the, re the, the, the finishes. Next one. And here you see the detail of the, of the roofing here. Next one. And here there is, a, OK, next one. You see the, the atrium here, the, the view of the atrium. Uh, next one. Here's an image I like very much because you can see the, the way the adjustment of the roof to the cornice of the building is always, always uh, impeccable. At the same time, you see the, the composition and all the, the relationship with all the elements of the existing building. The geometry is very, very important. Next one. The first image we had from the, the, uh, the light of the roof uh, when, when the, the scaffolding were dismantled. Next one. And now we show the, the image of the, the completed project. Next one. So the first thing you see is uh, the way the, uh, the way this kind of veil is adjusted to the to the to the existing building, and uh, okay, uh, it's something. There is a bit of uh, uh, we try to, to give this contrast of the very light veil falling on the building at the same time something which is signing a change uh, very, very very clearly. Next one. Then you can see the, the, the material we used, uh, only one wood and the color of the wall, that's it. And it's one of the courtyard. In fact, originally, the super, the super and the chamber have no, no connection with the courtyard. So we create this connection, which didn't exist. And there, there were a kind of French windows, uh, in fact, opening to the void, originally. Next one. That's uh, the, uh, the atrium in, in between and the creation of these two uh, sky bridge. Next one. A bit the same kind of uh, 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 view about the, the color scheme and the fact that we use one wood, one stone, etc. Next one. What is important is that we pay a lot of attention in the project to there is, I see, 340 windows in all, in all the building. Each of them has been tot totally kept. Each of them has been, uh, uh, it has been, uh, we have created a kind of window reveal with a fat wall, with a new window here, which is completely uh, uh, bomb uh, proof, blast proof, and so on. And, in, and behind, you have the, you see a bit the, the, the frame of the historical build, the historical window, which is completely uh, kept as it was. So we, we have created this kind of uh, double system of window, and we have created these 340 benches uh, around, the, around the building. Next one. Of course, we, we add some sky bridge, transforming uh, window into doors here. Next one, the relationship between the veil and the, and the stone. Next one, uh, another one, yeah, that's an existing dome. 
That's a new structure. In fact, the structure uh, of the wood is not touching at all the structure of the building. It's completely independent. Next one, you see a bit the color scheme. And that's it. So after that, we uh, just very quickly tried uh, to, to teach uh, for, for one semester to a young student how uh, to uh, layer things in the, in, the, in, in the design. And it was not a, a very easy exercise. So we show some examples. So uh, next one. Next one. So we, we, I, I tried to show them really, uh, you know, a uh, magazine of the 30s uh, and to uh, help them to understand what was in the arch architectural magazine of the 30s. So I have a uh, you know, of magazine of that kind and that I tried to, uh, to uh, explain to them what was happening in the 30s. What was the neoclassic and what because these two, two buildings are neoclassical buildings, are very, and maybe the latest neoclassical building built in the world. And they are very int interesting buildings because they, are, they are because they reflect the resistance of neoclassical people against modern movement. So it was a, a, a very, uh, very interesting building for that. So I tried to explain a bit to them what was happening at that time in the 30s. Next one. Of course, and I try as well to show them what was happening today, uh, compare the, 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 the magazine of that time, etc. I try to help them to understand the layering of time and what, in fact, each layering has its own cloud of culture around it. And I try to explain that. Because I think it was a bit difficult. Next one. And I, I asked them to, uh, to design a few elements in the in the gallery and to try to think about what is to layer things in the gallery. So I tell them, OK, there is the, the, the yellow layer, there is the, my layer, I said. The red layer, try, try to do a, a kind of green layer. And I have a few, next one. So I have a next one. So I have a few discussions with them. And OK, we, get, we go very quickly, this one. one uh, so there is different kind of, of course, I try. Uh, to, to uh, uh, ask them to do a kind of case study of the existing gallery, next one, and to propose something, which is, uh, okay. so, uh, I have this kind of design, next one, another one, next one, historical study, and uh, another one is the kind of uh, boxes with, uh, next one, next one, so next one, the next one. Next one, finished. Next one, next one. Okay, it doesn't work very well. Okay, just the next one. So all of them did this kind of exercise. What, uh, what I can say, they try always to get very far, far away from the building. They, they didn't really dare to interact with it. Meaning there is a kind of sh uh, shyness, something which is a bit, uh, it, it, it reflects that it's not so easy to interfere with an existing building. It's not easy. It, uh, it needs a bit of courage. It needs the understanding of the building. And he, he needs the fact not to be, to be afraid by it. And, and that's very important <coughs> because, uh, um, and we can have a discussion now <laughs> among specialists about that, but I have the impression that a, a lot of conservation attitudes are very, very, very driven by the fear of touching it. Where in fact, we know that the, let's say the, the beauty of many European cities, for example, are in fact based on the fact that no one was afraid of modifying an existing building. And that the dynamism of this city is, is, is in fact related to the fact that this building has always been reused, changed, adapted, and, and uh, no one was fearful of a, of a building, let's say, you know. And of course we have to understand it, understand the building when, it, when we interfere with it. it. 
it's our obligation. So we have to be educated people as architects. We, we have this uh, obligation to know everything. It's not easy to know everything, but we have this uh, obligation to know everything. It's important. Uh, what does that mean to know everything? Of course, you do not know everything. Of course. You have this obligation to, uh, to have the will of knowing everything and, and b being a, a safe advisor to the people on this kind of thing. I, li I like a doctor. You, do, you go and see a doctor. I trust the doctor because the, he doesn't know everything. But in, in the relationship with you, he knows everything. Okay. It's the same thing for an architect. And you should not be afraid of touching a building. You should, should, you should be uh, uh, very, very, let's say, at ease in this kind of uh, um, with historical building. They are friendly. They are just something uh, we should not be afraid of. Thank you very much. <laughs>